Hello, and welcome back to the Genetics Lecture Series for VCU's Partnership for People with Disabilities and Center for Family Involvement. Again, my name is Drew Wico, and if you have not already listened to our first lecture, I recommend you listen to that before watching this lecture, as many details will build on top of one another. If you have any questions for what we cover today, or have any comments for how we can improve, please feel free to leave them below this lecture. With that, let's continue our series with today's lecture focused on inheritance. I mentioned a moment ago that we will build on from lecture one. So here is a quick review of the terms that we went over last lecture that will be important to remember for this one, especially since I might refer to some of the terms rather quickly when discussing today's topics. If you do not have a full grasp on these terms yet, that's perfectly fine. Being exposed to them more often will help you gain comfort with them. First, we have DNA, which is the holder of all of our genetic information. We didn't really go over this detail last lecture, but DNA is actually an acronym for deoxyribonucleic acid. Honestly, it's a mouthful to say, so we just say DNA for short. Our DNA is made up of the four bases, A, T, C, and G. These building blocks are like the words in a sentence, each one having its own tiny piece of information. If we have a collection of these bases that create a product, we call that a gene, which would be the complete sentence in this analogy. If we look at all the DNA in an animal, that would be a genome, and if we were talking about humans specifically, that would be the human genome. Finally, we talked about chromosomes, which every person typically has 23 pairs of. This is the structure made when DNA is packaged in a super compact way to ensure it can fit into every cell. Now that we've reviewed these terms, we will continue on to new material. We've talked about genetics, but we have somewhat ignored how we apply genes in practice. When discussing genes, we usually talk about alleles. An allele is a version of a gene that your parents pass on to you. You might be wondering how these are different from chromosomes. On the left of this slide, we can better understand this difference. Chromosomes are the structure that DNA is compacted into, while alleles refer to the version of the gene that you specifically have. You have multiple genes in each chromosome and 23 pairs of chromosomes. You also have two alleles, but an allele refers to a single gene and the version of it that exists. This means that you can have two different alleles for many different genes in each chromosome. We will continue to talk about alleles today so you understand that difference a little bit better. We will use these tables called Punnett squares to explain this. You can see in the table or Punnett square on the left that there are two types, the dominant and recessive alleles. We can see in this example that each parent has one dominant allele, or big D, and one recessive allele, or little d. You might be asking why this matters. Well, it helps us understand what combinations are possible if they were to have children. When a couple has a child, each parent passes on one allele. If each parent has one of each version, you see what combinations are possible for the child. If each parent passes on their dominant copy, the child will end up with two dominant alleles, shown in the top left with two big Ds. If each parent passes on the recessive copy, the child will end up with two recessive alleles, which is shown in the bottom right of this Punnett square. Finally, if one parent passes on a dominant allele and the other passes on a recessive allele, then the child will have one dominant and one recessive. You can see that there are two boxes to represent this outcome, because if the father passes on the dominant and the mother passes on the recessive, that's a possibility, but also the mother could pass along the dominant while the father passes on the recessive. I've made many versions of this table to show all the different possible outcomes. Here is a key, which is meant to be just the same as the Punnett square we were just looking at and talking through. This represents if each parent has one dominant and one recessive allele, but what if one parent has two dominant and the other has two recessive? Or what if both parents have two dominant alleles each? These Punnett squares show you the possible combinations for each of those scenarios. I did my best to keep the color coding similar to our key in the bottom right. The top row, where there is a single letter in each box, is the paternal genotype, or the father's two alleles, while the column all the way on the left is the maternal genotype, or the mother's two alleles. With these Punnett squares, you can look at the possible outcomes if each parent has different sets of alleles. Feel free to pause here to look a little bit longer. You might be wondering now why this is also important to go over, but this allows us to understand how genetic disorders are passed on or inherited within a family. On the left, we are looking at an example of one of the Punnett squares we just saw in the previous slide, but only in a visual format this time. We see that the mother has two unaffected alleles, while the father has one unaffected allele and the other is affected, which is orange. I do want to briefly pause here to just point out a little detail. 
I just mentioned affected and unaffected alleles, but this image shows normal and abnormal genes. I'm fully aware that this might have a negative connotation to it, but I will admit that the scientific community is not always the best explaining their reasoning for how they name or label things. In this specific example, and typically in genetics when they use the term normal, it's usually referring to which is the most common allele. Abnormal, in this same context, would suggest that this is the less common allele. It is not meant to say that one allele is right or wrong. Many would argue that this is a remainder of the fact that genetics, as a field, started in studying plants. Once the terms were established, getting everybody to agree on terminology when transitioning to human genetics became difficult. It obviously doesn't translate well without this understanding. Continuing back to our slide, we mentioned earlier that each parent passes on one allele to their children, but it's also important to know that the allele passed on is completely random. In this example, we see just that. The mother, no matter what, passes on an unaffected allele to her children, because she only has unaffected alleles to pass on. The father has a 50-50 chance of passing on either the affected or unaffected allele. We see in the middle two children, they do not receive the affected allele, while the right and left children do receive the allele. These two children are represented by the pink boxes in our Punnett square below. If this were a genetic disorder, we would call this a dominant genetic disorder. This means that just having one dominant allele is enough to cause the disorder. That is why the father, who has one affected allele, would have the disorder, and he passed on half of this disease to half of his children. Since each of the two children has one copy of the dominant allele, they each also have the disorder. This does get more complicated when we consider that dominant genetic disorders are not the only type of genetic disorders that exist. Recessive genetic disorders also exist, and that's what we see on the right. In a recessive genetic disorder, both alleles a person have must be the recessive type for them to have the disorder. If you only have one recessive allele and the other is a dominant allele, or unaffected in this scenario, then we would call that person a carrier. We call these per people carriers because they can carry the allele for the disorder and not be affected. But if two carriers have a child, then there is a chance their child will have the disorder. We see that exact scenario on the right, where the two parents are unaffected, yet each have a recessive allele. This results in one child being totally unaffected, two children being carriers, and the fourth child being affected. Below, we can see the Punnett square that shows this inheritance pattern, with the child with the disorder being the pink box. Before continuing, I do want to remind you that there is currently no way of choosing which allele is passed on as it is completely random. These examples perfectly follow the Punnett squares, but the outcome for one child does not affect the outcome of another child. In reality, it is totally possible for either family to have it such that every child has the genetic disorder, or that none of the children have the genetic disorder. The chances of each of these scenarios do vary a little bit in how we compute that, but we can go over that at another time. Overall, just remember that if we were to have a perfect representation of Punnett squares, these graphics would show just that exact inheritance in the children. One final note on Punnett squares is that this is how we measure the probability, or chance, of outcomes for children when specifically referring to genes. You can see how there are four squares, and the relation between the outcomes tells us the probability of them all. In our pedigree on the left, there's a 50% chance of a child having the disorder, and a 50% chance of the child not having the disorder, because two of the four squares are pink and two of the four are not. For the recessive disorder Punnett square, there's a 25% chance of a child having the disorder because one of the four boxes is pink, meaning there's a 75% chance a child will not inherit the disorder. Once again, we need to zoom out a bit better, or a bit more to better understand how this works, especially in relation to family trees. These two family trees, or what we call pedigrees, show a dominant and recessive genetic disorder, and the pattern that they follow for inheritance. Squares represent men, and circles represent women, and a colored in shape shows that they are affected by the disorder. This shows how asking about a family history of diseases or disorders can help a healthcare or genetics professional figure out what risks exist in your own family's history so that you can plan for your healthcare decisions for your own family. I know that seeing these general examples are not always the most effective at driving the point home, so here is a real world example of what we're talking about. This is the pedigree or family tree for PKU, a disorder that doctors screen for at birth. If the circle or square is dotted, 
This means that they were a carrier of the allele that causes the disease. While if it is totally filled in, that means the person has the disorder. Let's learn a little bit more on how to read the pedigree before we get into this one's specific details. A horizontal line between a circle and a square usually represents a parent pair, and a branching down to a new row below them represents their children. If they're siblings, they will be connected from lines coming from above the shape. If there is no line from above the shape, that means we're just not seeing the entire pedigree connected to that individual. Finally, each row lower represents another generation for that pedigree, so we can better understand who is on the same generation level as grandparents, parents, children, and later generations. From this pedigree, we can see that of the five children, the second row coming from the top two, two have PKU, two are carriers, and one is not affected at all. This is just one example of a pedigree for one disorder, but a pedigree like this can be created for each disease or even can be complex and have all the diseases in an entire family. Finally, let's talk about how you begin to gather this information for your own family so you can better understand your own health history. The best thing you can do is simply ask. Your goal should be to have a written log of general health and medical information. Begin with your own log of what your own medical history is. Then your parents are next in priority since you inherited your alleles from them. Next is your siblings, since they are your next closest genetic relatives since you share around 50% of your genes with them. After going through those individuals, try to get information about health history of your grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. In terms of what specifically to ask about, below is a table of what you should consider asking about. Getting important information like date of birth, age of death, and cause of death can provide a lot more information than you might think. Some other disorders or diseases to ask about specifically are any cancers, heart disease, kidney disease, mental illnesses, or even when those conditions were diagnosed. This helps professionals get a better picture of what trends exist in your own pedigree. Some other details you might want to consider asking about are things such as smoking and drinking habits, whether or not they were overweight or obese, or if there were multiple family members with the same disorder. You might not think that these are immediately important, but once again, the amount of information that you can gather helps professionals understand what might have been caused by genetics and what might have been caused by either life choices or what's really even important to focus on. Finally, the last thing to ask about is your ethnic background. This is because certain ethnic groups have higher rates of certain genetic disorders, since specific mutations and disorders have been passed down for generations. Overall, asking about your family's medical history can help you provide the most amount of information to your doctor or geneticist so that they can help you figure out what underlying causes of conditions might exist in your family. Hopefully this presentation helped you understand what an allele was, how genetics are passed down in families through inheritance, and how to start asking your family about medical histories so that you can begin to build your own pedigree. Next lecture, we will go over how we read DNA, the different kinds of some mutations, and how they can change how the genes in your body work. If you have any questions for this lecture, or have any commentary for how we can further improve, please feel free to leave those below. I want to thank you again for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed this second lecture.